I put about 10% of the fund assets into frontline. And in a few months, it, it you know, shipping rate started to go up and it went up to like 10 or $11 a share. I had a very nice gain in a relatively short period of time. And uh, I exited frontline, patted myself on the back and moved on. Then when I looked at frontline, I think a year or two later, it was over $150 a share. And I missed that entire ride. But I'll start us off with uh, a couple of our students. Uh, you know, I kind of aggregated some of the questions if they were, they were similar. And Sean Mahan uh, in our uh, Kelly Direct, Jay Goyne in the MBA program, wanted to, you to talk a little bit about just given all the investment opportunities out there, um, how do you identify which ones you want to dig in on further uh, before deciding what to buy? So, you know, what types of screens might you run? What are there, are there multiples or ratios that you really favor or avoid? How do you go from this huge universe of stocks to the ones you're actually going to spend your time on? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, well, there are a number of different ways one can go about it, a number of different ways I go about it. One needs a system where one can eliminate large swaths of companies where each company doesn't take more than a few seconds or maybe a minute. So when I, when I look at a business, uh, the first question that's going through my head is, is it within my circle of competence? And a lot of companies uh, would disappear based on that question. There are also entire industries I don't have much interest in. So U.S. healthcare is very corrupt and does not operate with market forces. And so pretty much anything in U.S. healthcare, I either consider outside my circle of competence or no interest. So if there's a biotech company, if there's a hospital, if there's a pharma company, uh, if there's some, you know, uh, you know, CVS, Walgreens, that sort of thing. I'm basically, generally speaking, not interested in, in those kinds of businesses. So it's a very quick uh, pass. Similarly for defense contractors, I'm a little skeptical about the uh, kind of the long-term nuances and whether things are as clean as they should be and so on. So uh, not of much interest. And also, uh, you know, a lot of tech names uh, tend to be high flyers and uh, they tend to lose me on, on valuation and such. So even there, uh, we're done pretty, pretty quickly. I mean, if I look at Snowflake, it would take me like about 15 seconds uh, to move on. And so, so a lot of things get eliminated relatively quickly. There has to be some, uh, something that's drawing me in. So one of the things I do is I, I look at Value Investors Club. And they have, uh, you know, thousands of uh, companies posted on, on the club and people are continuously adding ideas. Generally, that is a somewhat filtered list because there's a lot of restrictions on who can post ideas and the rules thereof. So it's a good place to go uh, hunting. It's also a very good place to learn because uh, many of the write-ups and then the comments are very insightful. So Value Investors Club is one possible source. Uh, value Line is another source. Uh, I have a subscription to Sum Zero, which is another source. And then uh, I typically get several investment ideas emailed to me uh, pretty much every day by uh, folks across the world. And uh, I look at those as well. And again, you know, uh, many of those may not fit for a variety of reasons. But when you go through all of this, some, some ideas and some companies stick out. And, uh, and then, then, you know, I'll spend more time on them. The objective when I'm looking at a business is to as quickly as possible, say no and move on. So if I can say no in 15 seconds, that's great. In some cases, it might take a minute. In some cases, it might go to 15 minutes, and then I might say no. In some cases, it might go to a few days. But uh, the idea is that uh, to 
be really good at saying no. So the business should be able to convince a very deep skeptic that it deserves deserves more time and a spot in the portfolio. So that's generally how I go about it. As a follow-up, uh, one of our students, uh, Justice Boyce, uh, you mentioned your circle of competence. How do you kind of balance the idea of circle of competence and diversification within your portfolio? Yeah, so I don't think one needs to be, uh, so one would not compromise on circle of competence for diversification. Uh, diversification actually is overrated and uh, uh, if you look at most entrepreneurs, uh, you know, Sam Walton and others, through their entire lives, they had no diversification. And they didn't have any sleepless nights because of that. So uh, there are also examples. I, I always give the example of uh, Charlie Munger's friend, John Ariega, who only invests in uh, uh, real estate within two miles of the Stanford campus. And he's a billionaire. And uh, his circle of competence is extremely narrow. It's not even real estate. It's real estate in a very specific geography. And uh, if you, you know, looked at his portfolio, you would say, well, this looks very concentrated. But uh, that has not stopped him from doing extremely well. So even if you understand just a couple of things or a couple of industries or even a single industry, and uh, your portfolio was focused on that industry or even focused on just two or three stocks, as long as the competence is solid, one should not be compromising to, to get more diversified. Could you just touch on, you know, where, how, how do you, you know, judge if you're, if you're you know, as you're trying to, look through your circle of competence where you you feel that you have competence and not what you know what kind of level of knowledge do you have to feel like you get to in order to feel comfortable that that's included in your circle of competence yeah so uh, to ask the question is to answer it so if you find yourself asking yourself the question is this within my circle of competence I can just make it very quick for you. It is not. And if you find yourself asking a question, what is this business worth? Again, it's not within your, comp your circle of competence. So if something is in your circle of competence, you would know it really well. Uh, you would know the two or three variables that would drive most of the outcome in the long term. The valuation of the business would be quite apparent. And so it is very important to stay dead center in your circle of competence, usually there is not a fine, uh, clear, clear boundary between competence and incompetence. So as you move away from the center, the degree of competence goes down and the risk factors on investing in those businesses goes up. So uh, as close as you can stay to the center of your circle of competence is, is the critical part. So don't be concerned that you don't understand many things. I'd say I probably don't understand 99% of stocks. And uh, I'm not particularly breaking out in hives about it. And uh, so, so you don't need to understand a lot of things. You just need to understand a few things well and stick to those few things. Great. Chris, uh, Morton uh, asked the question in chat. Are you able to ask it or do you need me to uh, ask it, Chris? Uh, yeah, I can ask it if you want. Yeah. Um, so in the Dundo Investor, uh, you had an example of a business you had to research to become competent. I think it was shipping barges. Um, so my question basically is in the context of that example in the book, when you're first starting out in the investment world, when do you recommend digging in to become competent in a business versus taking a pass? Does that make sense? Absolutely. So I think the, the shipping company, you know, at the highest level, shipping isn't that complicated. And uh, I was intrigued about a few things I had read. So I said, let me, uh, let me dig in some more here to understand. So I believe the business was, um, 
in the, in, these are ships that were VLCCs, very large crude carriers. And at the time there were like, you know, 400 of those ships in the world. And uh, so these, uh, uh, these VLCCs are specialized ships that transport crude. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't think shipping was too difficult a business for me to get my arms around. I wasn't very really familiar or I wasn't familiar at all with uh, crude shipping, but I was curious about it. So I said, okay, you know, let me see if I can read up on this and understand how the business and the industry works. And it didn't seem that complicated uh, to figure out. And, uh, you know, I was able to use a heuristic that uh, one of my friends in commercial real estate had told me. And I realized that that same heuristic and that same mental model would work in shipping. And so there was an insight uh, which I had gleaned and I thought that that insight would work in this area as well. So in commercial real estate, especially if you're talking about tall office towers, you know, 30, 50 story type office towers in uh, large metro areas, generally speaking, those office towers may take uh, four to six years to get built or come to fruition from the time that the, uh, you know, someone has the land and creates a plan and tries to get the permits. It might be uh, easily five years before the, the building is ready. And generally speaking, what happens in, in real estate is that when the market is really tight and when rents are rising a lot, uh, a lot of these projects get started because the economics look so favorable. And generally what happens is because there's lemming behavior, all these towers get started at about the same time and they get delivered about at around the same time. And so you go from a very tight market to, to a depressed market because there's too much supply. So this five year or five to six year gestation period in office towers, leads to booms and busts in commercial real estate. We don't see that same, uh, that same nuance in, for example, let's say industrial space or commercial warehouses and those sorts of structures because there uh, you could be done with construction in 12 to 18 months. So, there, the, because the, the time frames are so short, you're typically able to turn on and turn off the spigot relatively soon uh, versus uh, while looking at what the, what the situation is. But you know, you're putting up a 50 story tower, you're already up to the 25th story. It doesn't matter what the market is doing, that baby's gonna get delivered and it's coming out uh, regardless of whether people want that child or not, that baby is coming out. And uh, so, so that same, I noticed that when I was looking at the VLCC market, it had a similar attribute. So there are only three or four places where these ships get built, mainly the Korean shipyards. And if you wanted to get a new VLCC, you'd go to one of the Korean ship, shipyards typically and uh, put down a deposit and uh, in about three years or so, they would deliver you a ship. And if the, if the queue was long, it might take longer. And so these shipping rates in VLCCs, I noticed had very extreme fluctuations. They could go as low as $5,000 a day to as much as 200 or $250,000 a day. So there was a very wide range uh, way more than commercial rents. Commercial rents in office towers do not have a 50 to one variance in rents over even decades. But in the shipping business, you can see pretty large variances. So whatever I had learned about the office tower business, I realized that there was it was on steroids in the VLCC business. And the booms and busts 
would get even more exaggerated because of that huge variance. So these were, these were some of the factors that uh, made it interesting to look at that business. So it was just, it was really understanding the dynamics of how uh, daily rates are determined for uh, shipping crude oil and how you couldn't instantaneously increase the fleet, even if demand went up, because it would just take time uh, to, to build those ships, et cetera. So I think what you can do is, uh, if you're <coughs> curious, I think that learning about different businesses and learning about different industries and nuances is, is always been of interest to me. I love to kind of know how the world works. Whether we get to the point, whether we can make an investment or not is a second question. So sometimes we can, we can read or learn enough where we feel we've really got it nailed. We understand the dynamics that would, would drive that result. And just to, just to go a little further, uh, because it's such a, there's so much uh, great learning in that shipping example, is the company I was looking at at the time is called Frontline. And they were the largest uh, operator of VLCCs in the world at the time. I think the fleet, the global fleet was around three, 350 to 400 ships and they had about 80 ships. And the unusual thing about Frontline was that 100% of their fleet was on the spot market. So there are two ways if you are a ship owner that you can run your fleet. One way is you can sign long-term lease agreements with, let's say, for example, Aramco or Exxon or whoever, you know, some refiner, so that they would say, yeah, I will lease your ship at, you know, $20,000 a day for the next two years, for example. And in that case, whether they're using the ship or not or whatever is happening, you're getting paid. And so it, it, your, your cash flows are really stable. Or you could be at the other end of the spectrum where you're saying, I'm only willing to rent per voyage. And so when you have a ship that needs to go from Saudi Arabia to Louisiana, and that journey may take maybe 25 days or something, you can rent the ship for 25 days on the spot market at that time. So Frontline had uh, their entire fleet on the spot market. They also had debt on their on their ships, but the debt was tied to individual ships. So it was like a mortgage on each ship and there was, it was not, it was non-recourse to the parent. So at the time I was looking at frontline, shipping rates had collapsed, uh, mainly because demand for oil had gone down and shipping rates had collapsed to less than $10,000 a day. Eight or ten thousand dollars, and at that, at that, at those prices, they're losing money. They cannot make ends meet at that price. So when when shipping rates collapse like that, there is a second nuance that kicks in. So I'm sorry, I'm taking a little bit of time, but just to explain kind of how things work, because these are all things I I learned when I was looking at it. Is after the Exxon Valdez went aground. In, in Alaska, uh, there were a set of new regulations that came out around oil carrying ships. And they mandated that all the new ships that get built needed to be double hulled. So all the ships that were built after the Exxon Valdez crash were required to be double hulled. And the ships before that Exxon Valdez incident were single hull. And in the shipping business, when you rented these ships, single hull ships, which still existed, they were older, rented for lower rates per day than double hull ships. But when rates collapsed like below 10,000, what that meant was there were too many ships. And so nobody was renting single hull ships because the delta between single and double hull disappeared. And so typically there were these maverick Greek owners of these single hull rust buckets and they're sitting on this fleet and no one's renting it. And uh, scrapping of those ships skyrockets during those times. So the ship owners look at it, 
So one thing that real estate guys do is they project present circumstances to infinity. If current rents are high, they believe rents will always be high. And the ship owners are even more extreme than the real estate guys. So if the shipping rates are quarter million a day, they believe they will always be quarter million a day. And they all go to the Korean shipyards and place a gazillion orders for ships all at the same time, okay? So when the ship rates are low, like eight or 10,000, all these you know, Greek ship owners rush to all the scrapping yards and say, take my ship and give me the price of the metal because they, they just assume they'll never be rented or whatever else and so on. And they anyway know that there are these maritime regulations that make it harder and so on. So what ends up happening when rates are low is the fleet might decline from 400 ships to 370 ships or 350 ships because of all the scrapping. Then when oil demand comes back up, now you don't have those 50 ships. So typically what, what you would see is that it would go even more asymptotic than Bitcoin. It, the, the shipping rates would go from 10,000 a day to 200,000 a day in the space of three weeks or two weeks. It would go really fast because literally you couldn't find a ship, right? So everyone's clamoring for them. So when I looked at Frontline, I did a very simple calculation. I said, there was a website which would tell you what the selling price of these ships were. So I just looked at their fleet and said, okay, you know, if you shut down the business and sold all the ships, what would you get and how much is the debt and what would you end up with? And what's the stock price? And the stock price was I think four or $5. And liquidation value was like eight or nine dollars per share. So I said, there's no way to really lose money over here because if all hell breaks loose, they can keep selling ships. And as they keep selling ships, they'll they'll make more than the stock price. And uh, so I put about 10% of the fund assets into frontline. And in a few months, it it you know, shipping rates started to go up. And it went up to like 10 or $11 a share. I had a very nice gain in a relatively short period of time. And uh, I exited Frontline, patted myself on the back and moved on. Then when I looked at Frontline, I think a year or two later, it was over $150 a share. And I missed that entire ride. Because like I said, it went to the other end, which was euphoria. And of course, my whole, my whole thesis was around just something where I couldn't lose money, but I um, could have been a little bit more savvy about the fact that when you have these extreme compressions, you're probably going to see a pop on the other end. And I could have, for example, kept a small position or, or something, but uh, such is life. So. Sorry to tell you more about shipping than you ever wanted to know. 